Hello and welcome to Alatra TV. Today we will talk about the universe. We will learn from an expert on topics such as, is there life beyond Earth? Was Mars once inhibited and, was, and what happened on Mars? What are exoplanets? And the importance of studying space for humanity. Today my co-host is Alexei and we are happy to welcome Dr. Michael Summers, a planetary scientist and professor of physics and astronomy at the George Mason University. Since 1989, he has served on the mission teams of several NASA space probes in the role of science planning and interpretation of spacecraft observations. He's currently a co-investigator on the NASA New Horizons mission on the Pluto Charon double planet where he serves as the deputy leader of the Atmosphere Think Team. Uh, Professor Summers, we're so happy uh, for you to join us today. Please tell us just a little bit how you got started in the field that you're in today. Oh, well, thank you, Olga. I'm happy to be here. Um, well, I started when I was six years old, when my father got me a telescope. And um, I had no idea what to do with it. So I took it out in my backyard and I set it up and I looked at the brightest yellow star I could find. And it turned out to be Saturn. And if you know about planets, Saturn is the one that has rings. And I knew enough at the time that to, to know that, that Saturn was about 90 times bigger than the Earth. And that if you took Saturn and you set it between the Earth and the moon, the rings would encompass both. And this was at the time during the Apollo missions, and I knew how, how long it took the astronauts to get to the moon. But just to imagine a planet that had rings and it was so big and that I could see it in that telescope. It was a tiny little image. And in my mind's eye, I can still see that image, that, that image of Saturn. Of course, it, it didn't compare with Hubble Space Telescope images or spacecraft images, but that started it. I mean, I, I realized that there were worlds out there that were vastly different than the Earth, and I wanted to learn about them. And everything else is my career flowing in that direction. Every choice I've made is trying to get me closer to learning about other planets. Please tell us, uh, what have you learned? Is there uh, life on other planets? Is there life mm -hmm. on Mars or? Well, wow, that's, a, that's a, 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 in one sense, that's an easy question to answer. Um, we haven't found it yet. In another sense, it's a very difficult question to answer because we're not always sure what to look for. Um, we have one example of life and that's life on earth. And we know a lot about life on earth. We know about its history. We know how to characterize what it does, its chemistry, but life elsewhere could be vastly different. There could be life that doesn't use DNA or that's not based on carbon or use some liquid other than water. So how do you look for life that is so different than life on Earth. That's a struggle. I mean, scientists are really trying hard to, to define the cr criteria that we need to search for life on other planets. The other piece of this is that, a piece of the answer is that we have found things that suggest that life could have been there or maybe there in the future. Take Mars. I mean, Mars has um, evidence that early in its history, there was abundant water, there was fresh water. You could have drunk the water on Mars and survived. And there was a lot of it. There was the equivalent of about a kilometers or two kilometers thickness of water spread over the planet. And, what, and Mars was probably even more ha habitable than the earth was at the time. So life may have originated on Mars before life originated on the earth. And we even see that for most time periods in Mars history, there were a lot of interesting things that happened that produced chemical compounds like complex organic molecules that we found in the soils. You scrape away a little bit of the soil where it's preserved and there, there are, there, there's like reservoirs of complex organics. We know that there's liquid water underneath the surface on Mars now. There are lakes of liquid water, probably salty water. So if life was there at one time, it probably migrated underground as the environment on Mars got more complex or con let's say more uh, hostile to, the, to any kind of life on the surface. So how do you find life if it's there, but it's underground? That's a hard thing to do with telescopes or orbiting spacecraft. You've got to go there and you've got to either drill down or go into caves and search for it. So we haven't found it yet, 
but we, we, we see indications that Mars was habitable at one time and that it is still habitable underneath the surface. On Venus, for instance, recently phosphine, a molecule made up of one phosphorus atom and three hydrogen atoms, that was found in the atmosphere of Venus. Now, everybody knows that Venus has a, a, a surface that is so hot that it would probably melt this, this laptop in a few minutes. But the atmosphere, about 70 miles above the surface, is at room temperature. And there's water, but there's also sulfuric acid. So it's not exactly you know, benign for life. But we know that there are bacteria on the Earth, and we found them in volcanic reservoirs, water around volcanic materials, where the bacteria are thriving. They're, they're happy. They're as happy as bacteria can be. And these bacteria can survive in the atmosphere of Mars. I mean, of Venus, when we simulate the atmosphere in a laboratory. So Earth life can exist to some extent in the atmosphere of Venus, and we found molecules like phosphine, which are byproducts of life. But have we found the life? No. And, and just discovering phosphine, which you might call a signature of life, that's not adequate proof when we're talking about something as important as the discovery of life elsewhere. And then on exoplanets, we found, if, I don't know how long you want me to go on this, but exoplanets, we have found over 4,000 planets that orbit other stars. And that's how we define an exoplanet. It's a planet outside of our solar system. And we found planets that are Earth-like. They're bigger than the Earth. Some planets are mostly water. I mean, think about that. A planet that is not just covered with water, but an ocean 10,000 kilometers thick. And just 30 years ago, we didn't know if there was a water anywhere else in the universe. And now we know their whole planet's made out of water. And there are planets that have abundant carbon, the elemental basis of life on Earth. There are, there are planets that have atmospheres that are uh, somewhat similar to the atmosphere of Venus with carbon dioxide to give it a greenhouse effect and have it to warm up. And then there are, there are planets that are, that are even rather bizarre. There are planets that orbit two stars, some that orbit three stars. We've even found a planet that orbits four stars. It would never get dark at night there. And, and the carbon is interesting because we found planets that appear to be made almost entirely of diamond. And so it's, you know, we're finding so many amazing things, things that we never imagined. How do you even look for life in, in such a strange environment when it's hard to even know how to look for life on Mars? I mean, that's one of the big questions we're facing right now. How do you look for life, life like our own or life that's vastly different? There could potentially be intelligent beings out there that are 5,000 times more intelligent than us. Maybe they could, they could play you know, 10,000 games of chess simultaneously and at the same time compose a mirror fugue symphony. And yet they might need, not even meet our definition of life on earth. We would call them dead or call them rocks or something. So how do you do that? It's, it's a big question and it's a tough question. So no, we haven't found it yet. But the indications are that the, the possibilities of life, the, the, the plausible connection between complexity and the environments that we found out there, it's very, very strong. So I want to come back to Mars. So you said before there is indication that there was water on Mars. Would you say that, and it, there is, as you said, we could maybe be from Mars. Uh, so would you say that there used to be people just like us on Mars? Could we I wouldn't that? go that far. Um, okay. when, when, when I talk about life developing on Mars, most likely uh, it, it didn't get very al far along in the evolutionary process. It might have got up to, to you know, certainly bacteria, maybe um, small organisms um, like brine shrimp or maybe worms or maybe fishes while there was a, an ocean there. But the problem for Mars is that it's, its atmosphere was lost to space very early in its history. Mars is so small that it can't hold on to its atmosphere. Its gravity is not strong enough. And so the solar wind stripped its atmosphere off very early in its history. So however far along life got on Mars, it, it didn't have much time. And if you compare the time that Mars had, uh, that it, were, it was habitable on the surface, and compare how far life on Earth had proceeded in that time scale, you probably didn't have anything much more than bacteria 
maybe the kind of bacteria we find deep underground now. However, as I mentioned earlier, Mars is still habitable under, underground. So if as uh, Mars became more inhospitable, if, the, if life that was there migrated underground, it could still be there. There could be a biosphere of organisms underground that have been evolving there for billions of years. We don't know what they would be like. I think if they were like us and they were still there, we would see evidence of them. Um, but they could be vastly different than us. At this point, we don't know of anything like that. All I'm saying is that Mars was once habitable. Now, are we from Mars? What did I mean by that? Well, there are asteroids that hit planets all the time. And sometimes they will throw pieces of their ejecta into space. And that's happened on Mars throughout its history. You know, asteroids come in at, at velocities of 20, 30 kilometers per second, and they will throw th millions of tons of rocks into space. And we have found over 200 rocks on Earth, meteorites, that we know came from Mars. And we've studied those to find out what Mars was like. And we find, you know, or complex organic materials. We find, um, uh, or, you know, it's uh, elements that are needed for life. We find the evidence that there was water there. If there was bacteria on Mars or simple life on Mars then, and it hitched a ride, say, from that rock to the Earth, it would have come to the Earth when the Earth was still cooling off and when, you know, life on Earth was just beginning. And so maybe, and I tell my students this uh, in my classes sometimes, maybe we are Martians. Maybe, you know, we originated or life on Earth originated on Mars and then, you know, was sort of uh, kicked off and it, it was transplanted to the Earth and then Mars became less hospitable and the Earth became more hospitable as time went on. But it could have gone the other way or it could have been uh, exchange of material between Venus and the Earth. Maybe we're all Venusians, or, or you know, maybe it's a connection with the asteroids. Or, you know, th there's so much connectivity in history. If you look at the Earth's history, you know, the, the Earth hasn't been an, an isolated entity. It's exchanged material with other bodies in the solar system. It's interacted with the sun and the moon in climate cycles. Uh, there have been rocks from the, the moon that have come to the Earth. And, and all this connectivity is what has driven the Earth to be what it is now. And so, you, you know, we wouldn't have the same planet if there wasn't that connectivity. And it's the same if we were on another planet, thinking about the, the effect of, of, you know, life developing on that planet. We couldn't say that it was isolated. There's just so much connectivity. And even if you think about the, the most extreme event, like a cosmic ray, causing a mutation in a DNA that led to the evolution of a, of a different organism on the Earth. Those cosmic rays are produced in, in giant stars that are billions of light years away. So that connectivity extends throughout the whole universe to some extent. So uh, thank you. Thank you for your answer. I guess the concept you are explaining, I mean, that uh, um, my bacteria trans being transported, is it's called the panspermia, right? Right, exactly right. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, if we look at the orange color of the soil on Mars, uh, that it indicates that there is oxidation, right? And since there is oxidation, so at some point in time, there should have been oxygen, right? And what could have... Uh, yeah. Could, what could, be, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Mars has an atmosphere that's carbon dioxide. Um, we don't know what the early atmosphere of Mars was like. Most likely it was carbon dioxide as well. The carbon dioxide is CO2. So if you can break it apart, you can get oxygen. You can get free oxygen, atomic oxygen, or you can get enough of those to combine and form O2. Either way, you can use that to oxidize metals, oxidize iron and get rust. And that's like what we see. So the, the question is, was it free oxygen, like the oxygen we get from photosynthesis on the earth, or was it oxygen that came from just the decomposition of some of the molecule? I don't think we know the answer to that. We, what we can say is that right now there's oxidation that's going on, but it's not from pure oxygen. It's from something called hydrogen peroxide. It, it's something you will have in your medicine cabinet and you would dab on a cut to disinfect your, your cut. And that, that molecule, that stuff is, is in the lower atmosphere of Mars now. It, it sort of saturates the top few centimeters of the soil. 
But underneath that, you have almost no oxidation due to hydrogen peroxide. So you see, it can be a very complex question. The answer can be yes, there was oxygen, but it could be a different form of oxygen than we think of when we think about oxygen that we're breathing now. Very interesting, thank you. And mm -hmm. I know you mentioned the exoplanets. Could right. you, and you said that some are like Earth, some are yeah. full with water. Um, mm -hmm. Is the life on those planets studied? And how can we study life on those planets? Um, well, we didn't even know that there were any other planets in the, in the galaxy or the universe until about 20 years ago. A little over 20 years ago, we found the, the first planet around a, another star. Actually, it was around a pulsar, the cinder that's left over after a star explodes. And since then, we've been discovering more and more of these and you know, over 4,300 right now. We're discovering new planets at the rate of about one per day. So every time I give a talk like this or in my class, I have to check something called the Exoplanet Encyclopedia to find out how many planets are now known. Sometimes that number will go up at 40 in a weekend, or sometimes it will stay sort of the same for a few days. But there are vast numbers of these. Um, before I answer the question about life there, I wanna tell you about the numbers. Our galaxy is a, is a whirlpool of stars, about 400 billion stars. It's, it's a number that's hard to get your mind around, but that's roughly speaking about 10 times the number of people that have ever lived on Earth. If we extrapolate the number of planets we've found, there are over 100 planets in our galaxy for every single person that's ever lived on Earth. That's the numbers we're seeing. Now, when we extrapolate to the visible universe, we can estimate that as a lower limit, there are more exoplanets, more planets in the visible universe than the combined number of heartbeats of all the people that have ever lived. In fact, the number is so large that for every single heartbeat of all the people that have ever lived, there are 10,000 planets. I mean, the numbers are just incredible. And like I said, we find planets that have the, 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 the requirements for life and some that don't. Maybe they have the requirements for life that's very different than us. Right now, there's a, it's very difficult with the technology we have to say if there's life there or not. Um, about the only way you could do that is to, with technology that we have now, is to look for the composition of the atmospheres. If we found an atmosphere around another planet that had molecular oxygen, O2, and had things like water in it or methane, that would be something that you don't find naturally. You don't find that apart from life. So that would be a signature that there's life there. Or if we found some other chemical in the atmosphere that's only produced as a metabolic byproduct of life, that would be a signature of life. But it turns out that that's incredibly difficult to do with the, the telescopes that we have now and the instrumentation we have now. It will be able to do it in the next five or 10 or 15 years with bigger telescopes and better instrumentation. But right now, identifying life, even life like us, or at least life as we understand cells, that's based on carbon, that uses water and so on, it's an incredibly difficult problem because the, the plant, exoplanets are just so far away. We only see just either see them indirectly because of gravitational pull on a star, or we only see them as tiny little specks of light that we have to study very carefully. So I'm gonna say that, that right now we have no evidence for life, but within the next generation, um, if I was a betting person, I would bet strongly that we will discover life of some sort within the lifetime, say, of our children, um, maybe you know, a little bit more than a generation. Um, and the other thing I would bet is that I bet whatever we define, uh, find, we, we will have a hard time defining it as life. We're going to be surprised. Um, that's, that's probably the one rule that we've discovered in all of space exploration, in, in all of our development of bigger and bigger telescopes. Whenever we go somewhere, you know, send a spacecraft to another planet or a comet or a moon, or whenever we get a bigger telescope, we're astonished at what we find. And, and that has gone on for, for 50 years in space exploration. We're always, always, always surprised. So much so that we expect to be surprised 
And even then, even though you're expecting to be surprised, you're still surprised. I mean, it's, it's a very difficult thing to articulate that you know you're going to be surprised. So you try to think of all the bizarre things you could find. And then you're surprised beyond that. I, I mean, when we would send the New Horizons spacecraft to Pluto, who would have ever guessed that we would find dried up lakes on Pluto, a planet that's 30 times further away from the Earth than, than uh, further away from the sun than the Earth is. And, and yet we now know that Pluto even has an ocean of liquid water inside of it. And there's complex organic material on the surface abundantly. There's more organic carbon per square meter on the surface of Pluto than you'll find in the Amazon forest. But as far as we know, there's no life there. But the essential ingredients are there. Who would have ever expected something like that? I mean, I had studied Pluto for 30 years before we flew that spacecraft by there. I would never have expected any of those things. We were surprised. We're going to be surprised again. Yeah, sure. This is, uh, this is quite interesting. Uh, but uh, we also wanted to uh, get your opinion on uh, what could have um, happened to Mars so that it loses its atmosphere. Like, uh, what kind of um, processes can happen to planets uh, in order to uh, such an ex like extinction event, if you want, uh, to happen? Yeah, so we, we have an orbit. The Earth has an orbit between Mars and Venus. And, and both of those planets give us an indication of how planets could evolve differently. Like Mars was small, and so it, it has lower gravity and it has a hard time holding on to its atmosphere. And, and so early in the solar system history, uh, after Mars formed, it, it had abundant water and had an atmosphere and it had a temperature that was probably room temperature. But because its gravity was so weak and because it didn't have a magnetic field, the solar wind, the wind from the sun, stripped that atmosphere away on a time period of a, you know, half a billion years or so. That by a billion years after Mars formed, it was cooling off and its atmosphere was largely gone. And it was solely a consequence of Mars being small with low gravity and not having a magnetic field. Now on the other side, Venus, we have the opposite case. Venus is bigger, about the same size as the Earth. And Venus, uh, because it's bigger, it held on to its atmosphere. But the atmosphere it has is carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And so it kept an enormous amount of this greenhouse gas in its atmosphere. And because of that, its atmosphere is now is incredibly hot. You know, it's, it's at a temperature that would melt lead in just a few minutes. And so it became a different planet. It evolved differently than the Earth or Mars. So did the Earth just happen to be right between the two? I, I think the proper way to think about planets is that every planet is unique. Every planet has unique starting conditions, you know, composition, size, location in the solar system. And it has its own uh, unique life. It's, it, it's, it's like the nature nurture argument all over again. You know, is a planet the way it is because of the way it started? its initial materials that were there or the way it evolved? And the answer is just like humans, it's a combination of both. And so every planet in the universe is gonna be unique. It's like every person on earth is unique because of unique DNA and unique life. Planets are gonna be the same way. Now, sometimes they evolve by catastrophes and, and that may have actually happened for Mars. We, we're not quite sure. We know that there are huge volcanoes on Mars. There are volcanoes that are a thousand times bigger than any volcanoes on, on Earth. There are volcanoes that are 600 kilometers across, and there are several of them. So that could have been a catastrophe for the surface of Mars when these erupted. We also see that Mars has huge scars, rips in the crust that are 3,000 miles across and hundreds of miles wide. You know, and so what produced that? You know, what caused the whole crust to buckle and bend and then to crack and then water to flow down them? It was probably a catastrophe. And Venus too has probably undergone catastrophes. And we know the earth has undergone catastrophes. Um, the, the KT event that wiped out the dinosaurs was an asteroid that hit the earth. 
But we have evidence that there were bigger asteroids than that that hit the Earth longer ago. And we had big volcanic events on the Earth too. So the, the, the answer is gonna be complicated that every planet is going to depend upon its unique conditions, its unique evolution and catastrophes are definitely gonna play a role in just about every planet that's out there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Summers. What about, what can we say, uh, you said that we live at an interesting time. What do you mean by that? What kind of discoveries are happening right now? Yeah, I mean, sometime I, I just can't believe the, the, the number and the kind of discoveries we're making on a, on a weekly basis or a daily basis. I, I subscribe to various news lists about science and space exploration. And like I said, every day, on average, we discover a new planet. Every day we learn something new about the planets in our solar system. Every day, the spacecraft we have in the solar system that are operating are sending us back new pictures and new things. And we have spacecraft are now leaving our solar system. And all this has happened in my lifetime. What's gonna happen in the lifetime of my children? My guess is that they're gonna see the first cities in space. And their children are gonna see the first attempts to change planets, to, to terraform them, to make them like the earth. And they may even see uh, the first attempts to genetically change us so that we can live in those environments. Um, and all of that is just gonna happen just in the next few generations. But think about that, ours is the first. My generation is the first that first saw these things that first saw the planets as like a little speck of light and the first generation that then went there and sent spacecraft there and sent back pictures. And then we went beyond that and it was still going beyond that. Now, like I said, there are discoveries all the time, but sometimes they're, they're kind of buried in all the other things that are going on in the world. There are a lot of other important things going on in the world, but there's also a lot of sort of what I call noise. You can't say it's unimportant, but it, 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 it sort of buries the fact that discoveries are being made in space exploration on other planets about Earth history that are constantly changing the way we think about ourselves and how we originated and what our future is. And so to me, I can't imagine living at a better time in human history. As long as we don't cause ourselves to become extinct, you know, I just, I'm, I'm intensely jealous of what the next generation is going to discover or the next generation. And if, if this, this sort of theme of always being surprised is going to continue, imagine the surprises that our grandchildren are going to find when they leave the solar system and explore other planets or their children, you know, when they, they, they modify asteroids to, into cities, and then they just take the cities with them, take the asteroids with them when they explore other solar systems. Um, and then on beyond that, I mean, changing humans into things that can live in space or live deep underwater. You know, it's just like, it's almost like if you could imagine it and it obeys the laws of physics, it's probably gonna happen sometime. Yes, absolutely. And um, I have another question. What would you like to see in order to make space exploration more productive and more creative? More productive um, is sort of an easy question. The, the reason is that space, if you include things like the, the surface of the moon, has huge amounts of water. We don't think about the moon having water, but there's a lot of water in the South Pole. There's also metals. There, there's something called helium-3 in the soil that you can use for nuclear fusion. All of that stuff is on the moon waiting for us. I, I mean, we don't have to take everything with us. We don't have to take our, you know, like soil. We can make the soil there out of the rocks that are there or the carbon that's there or the water that's there. And the same thing can be said about the asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. There are over a million asteroids, each of which is bigger than a skyscraper. I mean, some of these are all metal and some of them are pretty much all organic carbon material in water. I mean, all the things you need to build habitats, to do space manufacturing, to, to do hydroponics, to grow plants, to, to make fuel for rockets. Uh, and it's just sitting there. I mean, a million of these asteroids and it's just sitting there that we can, you know, once we have the technology 
to take humans there or robotic spacecraft there and, and harvest this material, you know, mine it in some sense, it'll be easy because asteroids don't have much gravity. You can land on them, take off easily, and you can build habitats and you can live there and convert them into cities. And that's going to happen probably, you know, in the next 50 to 100 years. It's all there. Making it productive is going to be easy once we get out there. Um, the universe, in terms of like creativity, I don't think we could ever be more creative than the universe itself. I mean, we, you know, just trying to outthink, you know, what we're going to discover the next time we go to a new planet. I sort of gave up on that a long time ago because we're just, like I said, we're always surprised at what we find. So would you say it is important for humanity to study space today? Because I don't think we hear a lot of information on the news about space exploration and, um, yeah. you know, a lot of news dedicated to that. Yeah. Uh, would you say today it is important for humanity to study space, other planets, life on other planets and such? I absolutely, I think it's important. And it's, it's not just a, a curiosity thing, although curiosity drives a lot of this. Um, we live on a spacecraft. Earth is a spacecraft moving through space. And pretty soon we're gonna leave that spacecraft and, 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 and go to other spacecraft like the moon or Mars or the asteroids. That's our future. That's, you know, I don't like to use the word destiny, but if, if we survive as a species, we're gonna become a spacefaring species in just a few hundred years, maybe even less. And, and that's our environment, that's, that's our new neighborhood in space. We should know about that neighborhood. And there's another reason that's very, very practical. And, and, and this sometimes gets lost in, in the news and in education. We're, right now we're using satellite communications, satellites in space. We have GPS on our laptops and our phones because of spacecraft. We have satellites that monitor the weather they're in Earth orbit. Um, the military has vast interest in, in space applications for you know, potentially space warfare or protection, protecting our assets um, in space. We're gonna, we're gonna go there at, because of either curiosity or we need the resources or simply because the military finds it interesting. We are gonna go there. So we need to know what it's like. And then finally, I'll say, it's a dangerous universe. I mean, asteroids, wipe, an asteroid 10 kilometers across, not very big, wiped out the dinosaurs and sent the, the trajectory of the evolution of life on Earth completely different than what it would have been otherwise. And there have been big asteroids that have hit the Earth throughout history's, history. Just 100 years ago, a large one, um, uh, 1908, Tunguska, Siberia, an asteroid blew up in the atmosphere, probably about 10 kilometers high, and it flattened trees for hundreds of square kilometers. And that happens every hundred years or so. We're due for one now. And we wanna be able to protect ourselves against that, but we've gotta know where they are, find them, mark them, you know, model how they're going to evolve. I mean, it's dangerous and we need to protect ourselves and we can't do that unless we know about space. And then the sun itself, we think of the sun as being just a, you know, a benign heat source in the sky. But occasionally it has storms and it spews out what we call coronal mass ejections that can devastate the power grids on the earth, that can wipe out communications, that can kill, that can destroy the satellites that are in earth orbit. And there have been times even in human history when things like that have happened. In 1958, uh, there was an event where there was a, and this was a time when there was very primitive uh, communications, it was all wire and there's very primitive um, electronics. Even so, there was a, a solar storm, a coronal mass ejection that caused the wires and the, the teletype instruments in Boston to just catch fire. And that could happen, it could cause a trillion dollars in damage if something like that happened today. And from what we've studied with the sun, these things happen about every century. And the last one, 1858, you know, we're due for one of those. How can we avoid it? We can't avoid it unless we know what it is and, and know how to prepare for it. We need, I mean, it's a desperate thing. If we wanna live on this planet for a long time, we need to know about 
its environment. You know, the, the, the things that, that are promising, the, you know, the good news about space, but also the dangers. We really need to know about those dangers because they could, they could destroy our future. Yes, thank you, Professor. And um, I guess that in order to uh, solve these kind of uh, problems, we really need to develop uh, science. And uh, are there any obstacles uh, to this development of science in our modern world? Uh, and if there are any, would uh, you be able to do more if there were none? Uh, how, <laughs> how can we remove them, let's say? Yeah, that's that's a it's an exceedingly good question, but it's a very difficult question. Um, science is is still progressing. I mean, there's a lot that's going on that, like I say, is pretty astonishing if you if you keep up with it. But there are also things that are happening that um, are counterproductive. I'll just be be nice, you know, with, and use that word. Um, and especially in in North America, there's an anti-science sort of movement or culture buried in a culture that really appreciates science. And what I've found is that this anti-science movement can become very politically active and it can change the even the education, uh, educational plans of, of school systems, you know, at elementary, middle school, high school. And we don't need that. We don't need politics trying to set uh, limits on science. And that appears to be what's happening. And, and that's a danger. I mean, that's something that, that has harmed the development and the progress of science in our culture. It hasn't stopped it yet. And, and I don't think it's going to stop it, but it's a concern. It's a, I think it's a very serious concern, especially in North America. But there are some sort of anti-science movements around the world. I don't know how they're going to play out because it's, it's a complicated thing, you know, how countries develop, how they can go from, you know, being, having one sort of mindset about science to another one in just a short period of time. And it may not be possible to know. We just may have to live through it and see what happens. But um, I think that's probably the biggest danger right now, this sort of anti-science movement that we see, especially in North America. Okay, and uh, what do you think maybe if uh, all scientists around the world, uh, they would unite to solve these global problems like uh, protecting from the asteroid impacts or, you know, predicting uh, the kind of uh, solar uh, flares or things like that, would, would this help? Because I don't think that's right now it's quite the case, given that everybody wants his own like uh, patent or, you know, prize. <laughs> Well, this may surprise you then, because scientists are, in fact, doing those things. We have some scientists that are mapping the locations of all the asteroids in our solar system, but they don't have enough funding to do it adequately. They can only find the big ones. You could still have asteroids that could slip through and wipe out cities. You need funding to do that. It's, it's not something you can do in, in your free time without the proper instrumentation. There are scientists studying the sun and how it affects the planets. It's called space weather. And they're, they're doing the best they can, but they need support. They need funding. You know, computers are expensive. It just takes vast computer time to model some of the complex systems. And, and even things like climate change. You've got thousands of scientists that are studying climate change and, and trying to ascertain the effect of humanity on our climate and how that's going to propagate into the future. It's probably the biggest science problem we've ever attacked. And scientists are doing the best they can, but again, there's this political pressure to, to stop funding that kind of research. It hasn't stopped it yet. It has sort of dented it in a way, maybe dented the trajectory of the science. It could get worse, but scientists are doing the best they can with the resources they can, but it, it needs more. These are, these are not just idle curiosities. These are not just academic, you know, interests. These are things that affect the future of humanity on the earth and in space. And so you need to take these things seriously and seriously means you need to support the science. So it's not getting nearly the support that it needs in terms of understanding, you know, the things get, that can affect um, huma humanity and life on earth. Uh, people have a hard time thinking about more than just a few days in the future. 
and to think about these things that could affect us you know, years in the future or decades in the future that are big problems, but they're easy to ignore because we don't see them every day. And when they hit us, it's going to be a disaster. If we can prepare for that, you know, study these things, try to understand the environment of the earth, we can prepare somewhat. We can maybe mitigate the, the damage, or maybe we can even send spacecraft to asteroids and nudge them into a different orbit. Or maybe we can develop technology to harden the instrumentation in spacecraft against solar storms and, and so on. You know, it's, it's, you know, they're big problems, but sometimes they have solutions if you can support the science. And that's what we need more of. We need lots more support for science. Yes. Yes, thank you. It's great to hear that scientists today are working together in order to solve these problems. And I believe that it's a, it's a, such an extensive field that there is so much more we need to learn. And as you mentioned, with uh, climate change um, and all the other things we have going on today in the world that we can see, you never know if we will have to relocate to another planet, for example. I know it sounds very, you know... Uh, you know, it's, um, it's a strange universe and it's a dangerous universe. Like I said, there are opportunities, but the dangers are extraordinary. And um, I, I would not predict one way or the other uh, about what the future is going to bring. But if we want to be smart, we would try to prepare for it. I think the information is already uh, should play an important role in, uh, I mean, the information of uh, the general public of uh, the possibilities and of uh, the dangers too, so that uh, proper funding and proper, uh, how to say, importance is uh, allocated to science and especially planetary science and yeah, uh, space exploration. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, you couldn't be more correct. Um, but, but many scientists are introverts. I mean, they like to do their work and publish and, and communicate with each other. And I, I think more scientists should get out there and give talks to everyone. You know, every time there's an invitation to give a talk, whether it's to fourth grade students or to senior citizens, I don't turn it down. I've, I've given over a thousand public lectures in my career and I've only turned down one because I just couldn't do it. I think every scientist has an obligation to, to speak more about what they're doing and why it's important and why it's not just a curiosity, but it affects everyone on the earth. And because that's the only real method, that's the only real process we know of that's gonna allow us to keep our future safe is to understand. And to understand the only method is that we know of that works is science, you know, observing things. Um, and that's, you know, the facts and then using our mind and computers to model them and to try to understand what we see. I mean, that's what the Greeks taught us. And it's really been a method that's been very, very powerful for you know, over 2000 years, but it's, it's, um, it's, I don't think it's appreciated for exactly how powerful it is. We could do so much better if, as you say, we had more resources for, for the different you know, domains of science. And it's not just planetary science, although planetary sciences, and I'm probably biased here, um, plays a role in our future you know, in space, um, a future as a species. Um, but there are other things you mentioned, you know, climate change, just here on earth, we've got to deal with that problem because our children's children are going to be facing it and it's going to be a life and death struggle for them if we do not deal with it, you know, soon. Um, that's part of the thing that worries me more than anything else because we've, we've impacted our earth so much that we've changed its, its normal life, its normal evolution. And, um, we don't, we're not quite sure how bad it's going to be, but our indications are it's not definitely not going to be good. And it could be much worse than even our models predict. But that needs to be more generally understood and appreciated. Uh, again, you know, my opinion. Yes, yes. Thank you. And I believe and I like your point of view too, how important it is to have, let's say, an open mind about discoveries. You never yeah. know what you're going to discover. You can't just say, you know, this is what we're going to find or we're not going to yeah. find anything. So when you have that open mind, anything you find is interesting. And um, 
I guess what I'm trying to say is right now, it sounds like um, we look at life on other planets and we compare it to ours, how we live. So we need water, we need sunlight, we need oxygen to breathe. Um, could it be that there is other life that needs other um, things for life? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, does life have to be like us? Does it need carbon? Does it always need water? Um, does it need even to be on a planet? We don't know the answers to those, those questions. Um, I wish we did, because, but we're, the, the truth is we're just beginning to understand the, the general limitations on life in the universe. We've got a long way to go for that. But the one thing that you learn pretty quickly in science is humility, because the you, you, one of my, my mentors in graduate school uh, was famous for saying, the easiest person to fool is yourself. And it's so easy to think that you're right and to be dead wrong. And, and this could be happening in science or politics or any field you think of. But in science, you're faced with that. Whenever you get new evidence, that evidence is ground truth that tells you whether your ideas are right or wrong. And if they're wrong, it doesn't matter how much you like them, they're wrong. You gotta set them aside and move forward. And so that humility I think is very important. And I, I think that it's probably missing a lot in our, in our teaching curriculum, you know, teaching students to, to, to be open-minded as you say, to realize that the universe is much bigger than what we've explored with our minds so far. And that, that, you know, like I said, we're going to be surprised. I have no doubt at all that when we find life elsewhere, that we're going to be astonished at what it's like. Um, and we probably will be astonished many, many times in, in the future when we find life elsewhere. But I don't know. It's certainly possible. And this is where you have to have humility. It's certainly possible that we are the only intelligent, sentient entities in the whole universe. That's possible, given what we know. I don't believe that. And if I was a betting person, I certainly wouldn't bet in that direction. But we have to have the humility to, to say, we don't know what we're gonna find. All indications are in this direction, but our history tells us we're gonna be surprised when we go there or when we go around the next curve and the, the, the exploration of the universe, we're gonna be surprised at what we find. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Summers. We're so happy that you can join us today, that you could share your knowledge with us and with our viewers. Um, we're truly excited to have you here on Alatra TV. And uh, today for our viewers, I would like to remind you that uh, we invite you to the third international online live broadcast, Kaleidoscope of Facts, on the topic of paleo contact on October 13th. This conference will be translated into 10 languages uh, simultaneously. Uh, so please join us and we would be happy to have you. And Dr. Summers, thank you so much. Alexei, thank you so much for being thank with you. us thank today. And now, and now we'll just watch a small trailer and okay. have a good day. Okay, you too. Goodbye. What do we know about the contact of earthlings with alien races? Is paleo contact a myth or a reality? International Research Project, live broadcast on October 13, 2020. What is paleo contact? The Anunnaki and the Apexians. Who are they, and what role do they play in the history of our planet? Hidden historical facts. What happened 24,000 years ago? Is the Earth indeed the birthplace of the human race? What happened to Mars? Who gave the unique knowledge about the structure of the universe to the African tribe of the Dogon? How will a comprehensive study of paleocontact help preserve our civilization? 
evolutionary leap in development of science, the exploration of other planets and galaxies by humankind, comprehensive development of civilization, a life worthy of a human being. All this is possible if we invite experts and scientists from various fields of science, as well as researchers and bloggers for joint research. Anyone who is interested in this topic, together, we will be able to find answers to these and other questions. It's time to bring the truth back to people. October 13th, 2020, Third International Online Conference Paleo Contact. Within the framework of the global unique project, Kaleidoscope of Facts. Initiated by participants of Alatra International Public Movement from the USA.